thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Amanda. We're learning all about uh, acoustic design of buildings specifically. We're going to get into timber also. Uh, I'd like to start with the question of just how do we measure sound? Yeah. Um, so if we're doing sound measurements in a building for, say, commissioning testing for a sound insulation, we would get a loudspeaker in one space and play either white noise or pink noise in that room and then we measure in the adjacent room as well to get the level drift difference between the two. Uh, if we're just talking about background noise and things, we use a sound level meter to measure the ambient sound in the space. Um, so that's fundamentally how how we would do it. Mm. So from what I understand, there's, when it comes to buildings, there's in, impact transmission and airborne sound transmission. Can you tell us a little bit about the, what these two different things are and uh, and how you can design for them? Yep. Okay. So airborne sound transmission is the noise that comes from, say, one room into the next room. And it, it is a function of the constructions between the room. So if you've got a door between those two rooms, then typically the door is the weakest element in that construction. Um, so that's when we're referring to sound insulation. It is the ability of the structure to reduce sound between the spaces. Uh, when we're talking about impact noise, um, that is the noise generated by things like footfall on a flooring surface that can be transmitted through the structure. So it's a different mechanism of sound. It's, it's what is um, generated on the structure that comes through, if you like. Um, for both of them, uh, there's something which we call flanking sound, which is effectively the ability of sound to come through um, small gaps and uh, construction detailing between the spaces. Um, and that's an important aspect when we're talking timber buildings because there's a lot of continuous elements between the spaces that need to be uh, factored into the design that can carry that sound between two rooms. Mm. And how, how does sound perform differently in, in general for timber and and, uh, and concrete buildings? Um, so timber is a fifth of the mass of concrete. So concrete has a much greater um, level of damping of sound uh, between two spaces, whereas you don't have that same um, sound reduction with timber. And as an example, um, if you put the two side by side, so the same thickness of concrete and timber, you could expect a sound reduction just in the raw form of timber, say RW37, um, whereas concrete will be more like 50 to 55. Mm. So mass is obviously one big factor. What other factors that um, fundamentally help with good acoustic design? Um, for really good acoustic design, like it, there's nothing holding us back from using things like timber provided the detailing around it. Um, is sufficient. So if we haven't got the mass, one of the other techniques that we use to get the same performance is to have um, air cavities and then a separate construction. So something like a, you know, a stud wall in conjunction with the CLT lining or um, a separate ceiling, uh, resiliently mounted ceiling to get the same overall performance. Um, we can also improve the mass of it by using things like a screed um, on top of the material to just bump up that um, performance. And that helps us to control the flanking sound between spaces as well, because we can stop and start that screed either side of a room, mm. um, which takes out those direct paths between the spaces. Yeah. So screed's one, one thing that's uh, obviously been utilised a lot. Is there any other products on the market that are dry, you know, don't involve wet trades to get that additional mass that you might need that you've uh, used in the past or looked at using? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are mass boards around. So um, when we're looking for mass, we use products like um, fibre cement or compressed fibre cement. Uh, so there's a product called Sky On Board, uh, which is excellent in terms of achieving that additional mass so that in conjunction with a resilient underlay for a floor can get you the same performance. Um, 
Other options are systems like a batten and cradle system, which is like a timber um, joist with a flooring system on top, but it's got rubber element to the CLT so that we're again getting our impact and our airborne sound reduction through different means. And those are both dry trades that can be used in the construction rather than a screed. Mm. That's for mass. And you mentioned about flanking issues uh, because one of the being, I'm a st- structural engineer and there's a bit of a challenge trying to get the continuous floor plan all, all the way through, but at the same time, you know, yourself being an acoustic designer, uh, continuous has con- uh, creates a flanking path for sound to transmit between um, sole occupancy units. Is there any interesting ways of actually overcoming that and engineers and acoustic designers can come together for what the best solution is? And is there any products or specific details you might recommend on how to achieve this? Um, It depends on what um, the project team is trying to achieve. So, for example, on one of our most recent projects, there was a desire to have the CLT product exposed, which meant that um, we had to look really carefully at the potential flanking paths. And when I say flanking, one of the one of the ways I like to think of it, if you stand in a room and you scratch the wall surface, so let's say it's a it might be a um, lightweight wall, and if you put your ear on it on the other side, you can hear that scratching sound through. So it's actually transmitted in that um, lightweight lining. Mm. So that's what we mean by flanking. Yeah. So if we're trying to stop that, then some of the ways of doing it is to actually put a physical break in it. So a control joint, um, obviously not possible to do with structural elements. Um, and one of the other ways to do it is to use things like the um, rotherblast strips. So a rubber strip between the structure um, to make a physical break. The rubber is effectively doing the same as what a physical joint would do between the spaces just to provide that mismatch in the material so you haven't got that direct transmission through. Again, mm. if you go back to that example of scratching on a wall surface, if you put a rubber joint in it, then that won't get transmitted through to the adjacent room. Mm. Have you uh, been involved with any on-site testing of any projects or timber projects that's been completed and and how close were these tests to what your uh, design um, results were? Yeah, we've done testing on a couple of um, very different sites, so very different makeups. One was a building that was being um, floor levels uh, placed on an existing concrete frame, so to three levels, so lots of existing detailing that needed to be dealt with um, and was all lightweight and we found that that has achieved the um, the on-site performance of DNTW plus CTR 45 um, and we have also um, most recently undertaken testing for a student accommodation building which again has achieved performances far in excess of what we're expecting in terms of the floor to floor transmission. So in some cases where um, we're almost 8 dB higher than the uh, 45 requirements, so up to DNTW plus CTR 53, but the room to room performance across the wall um, was 45. So um, it certainly demonstrated that timber detailing can be made to achieve um, and with quite successful outcomes. Absolutely. And from the experience you've had on projects, do you have any advice on how or when acoustic consultants should be engaged and what and if they're engaged early and how they might be able to contribute and uh, reduce the risk for a project? Yeah, absolutely. On a timber project, I would strongly recommend that the acoustic consultant is engaged as early as practical um, because there's a lot of detailing that goes on that can have a significant impact on both space and cost. Um, So, and if you get somebody on at the end of it and just expect them to sign off on a set of drawings, it's likely that you will get either 
a performance that doesn't work or you won't get that sign off and then you'll back to the table there's a lot of rework in terms of the design process so particularly where you want to have things like exposed clt structure where uh, you know there's a, a desire to express uh, the timber elements and it means that there's a, a whole lot more flanking that needs to be considered in the design